Hi, everyone, and welcome to Sports Break. I am joined today by Kelsey Trainer, a lawyer, producer, and writer who resides in New York City. She currently serves as in-house counsel for a national media company. Formerly, Kelsey worked for the hit CBS series, Blue Bloods. She's a two-sport collegiate athlete, a former college coach, and also writes for a number of publications regarding issues related to collegiate athletics, equality in sports, and more. Kelsey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, super excited to chat just about sports and everything. But real quick for listeners who maybe aren't familiar with who you are, just give like a quick little snippet of your professional career, just like the the highlights of what's been going on the last couple of years for you. Yeah, so I'm originally from Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area. I went to law school there. I practiced law there. And um, I ended up two or three years ago, uh, completely leaving the law altogether and uh, moving to New York to work on the show Blue Bloods. I went from like having an assistant as a lawyer to being an assistant uh, for the executive producer of the show. So I kind of totally switched things up, uh, left my career, uh, my my field for a bit, um, and then got back into it uh, another probably year after that. And I'm a lawyer for a media company, so I do like entertainment law and that fun stuff. Um, But I played sports. I coached uh, college basketball before I went to law school. And so obviously I've just always been a fan. I love watching it. I love playing it. You know, I still think I can break ankles when in reality, like I break my own ankle. Um, So I just had the opportunity with one of the websites for my company to start writing um, and just, you know, kind of took off with that, started hosting a podcast and then just utilizing like the connections of um, people in sports. Like, you know, there's such a merging there with like sports and entertainment and TV and film and Hollywood. You know, obviously we have like, I think I just posted something online where it's like Natalie Portman and Julie Fowdy are doing an interview together. So there's such an intersection there and that's where I kind of try to place myself. Um, And also I like to speak on like legal things in a way in the sports world in a way that's like, easy for people to understand because at the end of the day, the law is super, super boring. Um, no one likes it. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's important. Like, you know, you've got the U S women's national team equal pay lawsuit and people don't really know what that means. So I just try to explain stuff in a kind of way that makes sense. and is not so kind of like legal jargon. So that's kind of my, uh, it's where I fit in, in the sports space. Not a lot of people really know what I do. <laughs> No, it's awesome though. And I think you're right. I think it's so helpful, especially on those updates that come out for the women's national team. Like to, I love going through Twitter and seeing like people who know what all the jargon is. Cause aren't they like Friday night? Dumps? Yeah. It's like a, usually a Friday night news dump. And the like frustrating part about it is like, right. Like no one cares. No one wants to sit there and read or listen to like a motion for summary judgment was granted pro hoc, blah, blah, blah. Like no one cares. What does this actually mean for me? And what does this actually mean for the women? And so that's what I try to put out there. Just, you know, listen, here's what the the law says, but here's what this actually means. And here's the impact that this will end up having. Yeah. Just that one sentence you just said, I'd have to look up four different words. So. Right. Right. I mean, honestly, same. I forget what they mean half the time. (laughs) Well, yeah. So, so you mentioned that you played sports in college and coached basketball. That's awesome. I was a high school basketball coach for a little bit. What school did you coach at? Uh, Gwen and Mercy University. It's a small like D3 school uh, in the Philadelphia area. Yeah, I played, I actually played golf and field hockey in college. I didn't play basketball. I was recruited to play basketball and then got injured and, you know, Monday morning quarterback, wish I would have stuck with it. Um, But throughout uh, my college, uh, throughout college, I was able to coach my high school team still. Um, And then that led me to get an opportunity coaching college team. Um, which I would have done forever if, you know, I didn't, I didn't decide to go to law school or if it actually paid, you know, a decent amount of money. So that was fun. It's just like such a fun level of um, play. And then to also just get free gear, you know, like I'm in it for the gear, you know, let's be real. (laughs) And what was the transition like from player to coach? Like what mental shift do you feel like you had to do? I mean, I think that my my strengths as a player were that I always like cerebrally understood the game, right? Like I wasn't always the fastest, the best shooter, you know, I could score, I could play defense and snap, but I always like hustled and, you know, was that type of player. But I mean, I, I truly wish I actually could like coach for a year or two and then go back to playing because you just see so much. It is like playing that Monday morning quarterback, like post playing sport career, right? Like it was just kind of like, man, if I had, 
done those things, if I had practiced this way, if I had, you know, understood the floor a bit better. Um, so I always thought I was like a cerebral player. And then, you know, turns out, um, you know, I was just, obviously, I, I learned so much coaching that I wish, you know, I had known while I was playing, but it was fun. I mean, it's just fun to be able to, um, I think that's like probably one of the things I really enjoy doing is t breaking things down and making people understand things. Um, and, you know, sometimes I can do it, sometimes I can't, but that was fun to do in like the sports world for sure. It is pretty impressive to me when I see people, you know, 10 seconds left NCAA tournament, you have to get a bucket or you're out. And like, I don't, you know, it's, I would love to, maybe I need to have a coach on here or something because I would love to know <laughs> that they just have like a quiver of plays that are running through their yeah, head. Yeah, they do. They, they really do. I mean, you, you prep for those things and that's why the best coaches are the ones that like, you know, you, every practice you end on the same way. It's usually like a end of the game situation. Um, but you have those like two or three things in your head that you know what to do. And you also know what to do if they're playing this defense, if this player's on the floor, like there, it gets to a certain point where you've practiced so much and you've prepared so much that in those moments with 10 seconds left, the coaches that are winning and, and the players too are the ones that have prepared for every single scenario. Like practice should always be harder than the games because then at the end of the day, the games are, you know, just for entertainment, you know, at, at some point for sure. I love that. I love that. Practice should be harder than the games. Yeah. They should, should over prepare. What, who are some of your like favorite coaches? Like who do you, who do you think just like knocks it out of the park? I mean, listen, I got to go with the Philly love and uh, Don Staley, you know, and USA basketball. I'm just such a big fan of her as a person, uh, you know, from her time at Temple university um, where she was actually playing in the WNBA while coaching Temple, you know, like, women do it all. Um, and, you know, to see what she's done with South Carolina and that program is just so fun. And so I'm a big fan of her as a person. I'm a big fan of her as a coach. I think she looks out for her players and I like how her, I like how our team plays like the style of offense and the defense. And, um, I think it recently came out on Netflix, her coach's playbook. Um, and just like getting to watch her, it's a goal of mine to like actually get down there and watch like the game uh, in South Carolina. I was supposed to do it in March, but of course, you know, everything happened. Um, but just to see how she talks to her players, like she teaches them and she understands that it is kind of more than a game. Like, you know, sports are a microcosm of society. So you're not just teaching young women, you know, how to run a play. You're teaching them how to handle adversity. You're teaching them that, you know, this is, if you don't feel comfortable here, if you're not, something doesn't feel right for you good. It shouldn't. You're new to this. This is a place of growth and you grow in your, uh, you know, you grow outside of your comfort zone. So I love a big fan of Dawn. Dawn. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I love seeing her and Asia Wilson's back and forth. Oh my God. It's so funny. Yeah. She's great. She's like, she's been a really, she's been really cool to me. Um, just like personally. And then, you know, I, I don't care. I totally fangirl over her. She's awesome. You know, and then that Philly love, like it's, there's no love, like the Philly love <laughs> for sure. You have yeah. you even have a statue for it. Yeah. Um, so were you supposed to be at the women's national like final four or the tournament? No, I wasn't actually going to go to that because, um, you know, much to sometimes my dismay, like that's not my day job, right? I'm a lawyer for a media company and have to um, work <laughs> not in that, in that area. The sports yeah. stuff that I do is for the most part, it's uh, kind of fun. Um, and I do like write for, places and host podcasts, but, uh, you know, I obviously have a duty to my company. Um, but I was going to head down to, I think they had their last home game in, uh, in March. I was going to try to head down to that after the, she believes cup, I think. Um, and then just, you know, thought better of it, maybe with everything going on. The last sporting event I attended was the, she believes cup. Um, it was pretty, go out on. yeah, it was pretty epic. I got to see and hang out and, you know, meet some cool people there. So that was fun. That's awesome. I know it's yeah. been a, it's been a weird, just a weird time. I mean, I, you know, it'll, this will air after the fact, but they're, they've just announced that they're doing the camp now in Colorado and right. So maybe yeah. some coming back. I don't know. And you've got some players, you know, like obviously, um, Meg Rapino and Julie Ertz and, uh, Carly Bleed aren't on that list. Um, it's so crazy to think like they haven't played soccer for a very long time but mm -hmm. they're world-class athletes right at the end of the day like they're gonna do if they want to play in the olympics they're gonna do what they need to do to kind of get in shape and stay in shape and and form and 
yeah. you know, there's, I just don't think there's any way you're telling like Meg Rapino that she's not going to be on that team any, yeah. any way, shape or form <laughs> personal yeah. opinion, mm-hmm. but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so taking it back to the sports that you played in college. So golf, like what, what did you love about that? What was hard about that sport? Cause it's individual, but also you're on a college team. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was, what was it like? Playing? Golf was, it was interesting because I like played growing up, like I have two older brothers and I would just like go to the driving range with them or my dad or something like that. Um, and I didn't, I obviously wasn't recruited to play. Like I was fine. I was okay. Um, and my college started a women's golf team and a few of my friends were on the men's golf team. They knew that I played you know, played or we had talked about golf and, um, they kind of recruited me to, to join the team. And, um, I literally look at it, looked at it like kind of the same way. I was like, so wait, I get free country club membership, free golf gear, and I get to leave class. I'm in, yeah. um, you know, I wasn't like the best person on the, I guess, whatever you want to call it, the team. Um, but I wasn't the worst either. I actually had my first, um, I have the most epic story of my first collegiate golf match. Um, I was in like one of the later groups and, um, in my head, all I could think about was I'm going to whiff, like, I'm going to fuck this. I'm sorry. I'm going to put this up. Okay, we got the e. Right. We got the e. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to mess this up so bad. And lo and behold, I get up there, I swing and the ball, I whiff the ball literally goes like 10 feet ahead to the left. And I'm just like, cool, cool, cool. Tight, tight, tight. Um, but it, from that point in my mind, it was like the best possible thing that could happen because nothing else, like the rest of the time, like, great. You know, I, I sunk that, the, the putt on that first hole was like, you know, super far away. And I had other coaches coming up to me like, dude, that was like a really good uh, putt right there. And I was like, yeah, no, I just messed up my first, you know, I just messed up the first part, but it was, it was, it was a humbling experience for sure um, to kind of totally do exactly the worst case scenario uh for my first collegiate golf match um but yeah turned out okay well and the nerves i'm sure like all of that played a a role right and i played like i i never played golf competitively until college uh and yeah and so that was like a new thing for me if you put me in a basketball game or a soccer match or anything like that i would have been fine but i was like i don't know how this works like yeah it was fun definitely uh definitely fun and humbling for sure well, and that's one of the things too that like in talking with a lot of people about growing up playing sports that they learn is you can't quit, right? Like you can't, you have to keep going. And so your very first shot, if you had just walked away, it'd been like, yeah. Oh, I wanted to, I wanted to like, there was trees to the left. I just wanted to like go hide behind all of them. <laughs> and, you know, and then like everyone else in my group, it was just, you know, you don't know them because they're from other colleges and it's it just so embarrassing. But at the end of the day, it's like, whatever yeah. worst th- the worst thing I thought could happen to me happen and I'm still here and I'm still fine so you persevered and you made a stinking good putt and there you go yeah. there you go crushed it yep. yeah super fun that's awesome and I think that is something that's so true do you feel like that's helped you like later in life like that kind of mentality of like what's the worst that could happen or like I'll live through it and keep going yeah I mean kind of like I live my life right now with the kind of like shoot your shot mentality um and, you know, I'll be quite honest, I've heard no a lot, right? I've been rejected a lot. And, and sometimes, I mean, everyone kind of looks at what you do and only sees, you know, the positives, right? Social media is not real life. People don't see the, all the times that you failed or that people have said no. Um, but I'll tell you what, they were, there've been plenty and they've been often and they've been, you know, they put me in lows, right? Like they've, there's been times where it's just like, man, I can't get out of this or I can't make something happen. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like, you know, it's not going to stop me from doing it again. It's not going to stop me from asking, you know, somebody else to do something, you know, with me or for me. Um, because what's the worst that I can hear is no, right. I've heard it so many times. Um, and, uh, we'll probably hear it so many more times. So I just kind of still do that. I shoot my shot, um, you know, with anything and everything. And I also encourage other people too, to do like the same thing with me, like, you want something from me or if you think I can help you anyway, just ask, right? The worst I'm going to tell you is, Hey, sorry, I can't do it. Yeah. And then, you know, that's it. Yeah. I mean, this podcast wouldn't be happening without like just randomly messaging people. I mean, it hadn't even, it. we're launching the first episode today. So it's like, 
I had, don't have an episode to send to people of like, what's it sound like? What's it, right. you know, who are your listeners? We don't have any, you know, but right. what's the worst, you know? What's the worst? It's, yeah. it's all, yeah. And it's also too, like about doing things that you're passionate about, which is I've learned, um, you know, in the past few years is like, you know, you can do your work, you can this and that, but at the end of the day, you have to have, you have to care about some of the things that you're doing and they don't have to be your work. They could just be for fun. They could be, you know, something that could come something or, or could not, but as long as you're enjoying it, then, you know, why not? Yeah. All right. Now let's talk field hockey. Cause like globally, that is a very popular sport, but I yeah. still feel like it doesn't get much recognition here, even though team USA has been pretty good in the past. Yeah. I actually like in high school, I didn't, this is another fun part. I didn't play field hockey in high school. I played it growing up and I didn't play it in high school. And, uh, but the, uh, my friends did and like people from other schools that around me did that were actually on the USA field hockey team. Um, and it was another thing, like my roommates in college played and they were like, dude, you should just come out for the team. Like you're athletic. I was like, I'm going to be quite honest. I don't fully know all the rules. I know that a lot has changed like this or that. Um, and I already have a vacation scheduled. <laughs> so um, if the coach is like cool with that, then sure. And she was like, totally cool with it. I used her stick all season. Like I used her stick the whole time. Um, and it was just kind of another thing. It's like, you know, I didn't really know the rules. I still probably don't. Um, but I, I just love being like competitive and running and, um, you know, playing some type of sport. So that was fun. And yeah, I mean, it definitely doesn't get the, the, respect it deserves in the states i know that overseas i guess australia too like really specifically it's like very popular um but i don't know i i, I don't i can't explain it other than i mean just like anything else with women's sports it just doesn't get the coverage or the attention it deserves um you know the tale is old as time for sure yeah i mean i know it's it's pretty big in argentina like that's i think the right. most popular sport for girls and um yeah india too it's pretty big but yeah it's like drops in the bucket unfortunately we're working we're gonna get there it's in the olympics so that's we are good. we are literally trying so hard <laughs> we're no, getting there piece yeah. by piece for sure yeah uh gosh yeah and i mean i think that it's so it's so neat to hear how you know just like your love of competition and your desire to be active you were willing to take chances on things that like you've never done or hadn't done in so long i just love that and i think that I think it's so inspiring too when people in adulthood now like start doing pickup sports like that yes. like, like recreational yeah. like I just want to be active I went to um the Alley Krieger football camp down in Orlando one year that's awesome it was wonderful I, I'm right. waiting for a WNBA one like I want to go to basketball camp so right that. would be so that'd be so fun I, I joined a league in New York that of course you know obviously there's nothing happening up here but I was like nervous, like first game, like, oh, I was, I got new shoes for it and everything. Cause I haven't played, you know, I haven't played in a while and I got new Kyrie's. I was like ready. And I ended up thinking like, man, these, these girls are good. Right. And then the first, first, I was the first bucket of the game. And I was like, it's fine. It's just like riding a bike back into it. Yeah. It's so fun. And it's just like the camaraderie of like being on a team and, you know, I'm so competitive, but at the end of the day, I'm just not the best player in the world. So, you know, figure out ways to be on the best teams. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what's so fun too, is like some of those people that showed up at camp hadn't played soccer ever, but they, right. you know, love and admire Allie. So they were showing up. Um, but then afterward, like all these people wanted to join leagues and there is that mesh of, oh, I'm so competitive. I want to win, but also everyone can come, so play, you know, like we want yeah. everyone. Yeah, and there's more and more, like, when I lived in Philadelphia, there weren't really as many, like, women's sports leagues, and definitely in New York, there are a ton more. There's, like, three or four different types of leagues with different levels, which is amazing. I mean, there's options here, but, um, you know, I just think women obviously go through so much, whether it's work or whether they have kids, and it just feels, like, harder to kind of maintain that and feel like they can do those things for themselves. Um, you know, I think that I, I try to live like really selfishly in that, in that way that I just do a lot of things for myself that I know that I enjoy. Um, and one of them is to just go out and play sports, be active. It's just fun. You know, some people like to, you know, go on hikes or, um, you know, play guitar or this, or that. So just kind of staying selfish a little bit as we get older to kind of, uh, 
stay sane. <laughs> stay on the mental health. Yeah, like do yeah, for sure. Is is like a release in a way. Um, yeah. So real quick, just want to talk about Philly because I feel like it's such a unique city, and there's so many sports, and like Rocky is like synonymous with Philly. Like I, the community, I just know is so passionate about sports in general. How do you think that? I mean, how do you think? I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of what the question would be. I, like, I think we both agree they're important, but how do you yeah. see people in and like living there? Is it just everyone's talking or buzzing on this game day or what's it like in a community like yeah, that? Yeah, it's, it's pretty epic. And I'm going to throw this back to like, you know, I grew up playing kind of every sport in like in, in Philadelphia and the Philadelphia sports, like there's, you know, you've got football, you've got this and that, but like, if you actually think about it, it's a Mecca for women's basketball. Right. If you think Muffin McGraw, Gino Ariema, Don Staley, right? If you think the players, Elena Deladon, Natasha Cloud, like I'm just I'm just listing off some some people there. The, the list goes on and on and on. Um, even Kathy Engelbert, I think, spent some time, you know, in the area. But it's like a women's basketball mecca. It's got the the big five, the power, you know, those the you know, Temple, St. Joe's, like some of the, the greatest schools with the greatest players and Immaculata, which is where the first women's basketball, they won the first women's basketball, right, uh, NCAA championship. Um, and so it just was so influential for me to have, like, grow up in an area that did have such strong, like, women's sports base, because you don't see that everywhere. But I, like, I remember growing up, I, I played CYO basketball, and I was in the Philadelphia, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, right, like, when we won. Like, that's how the coverage was. That was the, you know, you could – when the championships were happening, like you could find young women's or girls sports, like in the news, um, because it's just so respected because of the people that have, you know, played in this area and that come from this area. Um, so, you know, in general, it's just a great sports town. It's just nuts. It's like just people are nuts, but, um, you know, really specifically to shout out like the women's sport, the women's basketball space there. It's just, I don't know that aside from like, you know, your kind of your old school places of having like, you know, uh, down South and, you know, Tennessee, um, you know, I, I just think it's like the Mecca for women's basketball. That's awesome. And I, I think that's so important, especially as um, young girls who want to see it as something they can do later on. I mean, I don't know how many people I talked to that had none of that. They had no right. female representation and you know, I grew up in North Carolina, North Carolina Tar Heel soccer is a dynasty. Right. Yeah. I grew up knowing Mia Hamm. I grew up, you know, knowing what Anson Dorrance was doing with all these amazing players. And yeah, um, it is different for us. I mean, it really is. You just think of like people, maybe, I don't know, in certain areas of the country that don't have that, that don't have that major influence or maybe it's like, you know, Friday night football is kind of the only thing that, that people really harp on. And it's, you know, I am so thankful to have had that. Even like my high school coach, she played for um, Gino when he coached at McDevitt um, high school. It's a small Catholic school outside of Philadelphia. Right. So just even like having all those connections, I like, played AU with Elena Deladon, not like on the same team as her. We just always tried out together and she would just be down on one end sh making every single basket while the rest of us 10 year olds were on the other end, not wanting to shoot with her because we would look bad because she, you know, she was making everything and we were, you know, everyone else was so behind her. Um, so even then I was like 10 years old, like looking up to Elena Deladon because, you know, she was just, just an epic uh, basketball, women's basketball community and, and really an investment in like the women's programs and especially for girls too. Yeah. And was she like, was she tall at 10? Yeah, she was tall. Her, her dad would drive her up from Delaware to um, Fort Washington, which is a, just outside of Philly, which is a decent drive, you know, maybe an hour. And we played Fencor, which is an AAU uh, team, and he would drive her up to the gym for tryouts and for practices every week, um, you know, two or three a week. And, you know, it was just it was just so – at tryouts, it was just known, right? Like, she would be at one end of the gym because she was so good. She was so tall. She was so nice. She was always just, like, nice, but, like, just intimidated by her level of, like, excellence, right? Like, she was so good. Um, and so – yeah, it was, um, it was, some, she was tall for sure. That's awesome though. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that 
it's been so neat this year alone with WNBA being so televised, NWSL getting more than ever. I mean, you're seeing all these tweets of, you know, these little girls that are in jerseys or out playing basketball because they've seen it now. It's just awesome. I mean, I, we both can agree there's so much to still do in the space, but um, hopefully they it is reaching those pockets, those, those geographic spots where like yeah. no one knew. Um, I think so. I'm I've I've been you know I'm probably one of the first people to always harp on the lack of coverage, um, and clearly you know there's so much more we can do, but. I have been thoroughly impressed over the past like year and a half, two years of what, you know, the grassroots, like what people have been able to do from smaller grassroots media outlets, but also that pre I think has put a lot of pressure on the bigger places, you know, the ESPNs, CBS and Fox um, to really up their coverage of this stuff. And obviously you're seeing it, right? The WNBA and the NBA for the first time ever having their finals at the same time. And the WNBA's final game was up, I think like 34, 44%. Um, while the NBA is is happening. Right. Um, and so I think that's just huge. And the reason that that is, is because it's on, it's been on ESPN all, you know, not all the time, but it's been on major networks where, you know, it's a Saturday afternoon. If you're some random guy that doesn't watch women's sports, maybe you're sitting home watching, putting, watching TV, switching the channels, and you turn on the TV and you see the WNBA games on. Well, maybe you're not going to watch it, but what do they do? They put it the game where Diana Taurasi is playing. Now these like guys, right? These people, athletes, they respect greatness, right? Like you can't be somebody who you can't have LeBron, Kobe, all of these male athletes respecting the level of play of these players and then be some schmuck kind of sitting at home, not. So you see that. And then it's a reminder, like, Oh man, I forgot Diana Taurasi still playing basketball, man. She's a bucket. Right. Like that's what you were seeing happening kind of all season long is that, you know, maybe these people weren't specifically tuning in for the purpose of watching these games, but it's on there. It's something to watch. And then they're like, man, Sue Bird playing basketball. That's something fun to watch. Uh, Diana Taurasi is a certified bucket. Um, and so that's, I think, something that like we've definitely been seeing all season long and it's, you know, it's a result. So, so there's still so much more to do, but I definitely think that we've seen a lot of improvement in the coverage and just shout out to the people doing it, you know, Ari Chambers, Eric Ayala, um, just so many people who are putting in the time and, you know, their livelihoods basically. Um, and hopefully, you know, that will reap rewards for them for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I was too. Well, thanks again for joining us. Is there, are there places people can find you, find your work? Where can people get in touch? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm usually on Twitter at Ktrain 11, uh, or no, Katrine underscore 11. God, I forgot. Um, and Instagram at Katrine 11. And, you know, I'll usually just put out any work that I do uh, there because I write for a bunch of different places. And, you know, you expect to find some women's sports content and then definitely some pictures of like me with pizza. Those are, <laughs> those are my brands. <laughs> I did like your, you know, then and now, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, that, that was right. Yeah. Listen, I don't have anything to show for it other than I remain, you know, very on brand to who I am as a person. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thanks again so much for joining us today. It's been a lot of fun just to stroll down memory lane. And uh, yeah, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.